大家好，我是 Andrew Sai， 我呃我我叫 Andrew Sai， 嗯、um, ，Is that 我我是二我叫 ，I'm sorry， my Chinese is really bad， I'm still a 学习。他讲说我叫。Yeah， I'm still learning， um， but at least I'm better than Steve。So um, my name is Andrew Sai, and I'm the CEO and uh, a founder of a company called uh, Vector AI. So um, I think we have an issue with the presentations. I think um, I will start to introduce a bit about myself and what's the relation with uh, BitTiger, and as well I, I will try my best to speak slowly <laughs> because uh, self-driving. Car is a really hot area, and then it's it's really hard to to develop. And as a founder of the company and as an engineer, I'm the person who slightly select successfully to build a self-driving car by myself, compared with other companies like Comai AI, Drive AI, Plus AI, and uh, autonomous stuff, and also uh, Udacity, one of the example. And I'm I'm really lucky. I'm thankful that uh, Beijing gives me and Charles gives me opportunity to talk today with you. Um, Charles, uh, I have a quick question. So, uh, are we ready with the presentations yet? Or okay. So um, I think I'm I'm gonna start over. My name is Andrew Sai, and I'm the CEO and founder of Vector AI. So what Vector AI does is um, we develop a platform to accelerate the development of self-driving car. So companies like startups, to one OEMs, they want to have some sort of development platform to accelerate the development of self-driving car. So we not only focus in self-driving car, but also we build the future transportation. We try to accelerate part of the, for example, with Steve, uh, the education, and also um, democratize the technology itself to many cases in transportation. Okay, so. This is a bit about my background. Um, I'm Max Hubler. I'm also work with the Project Tango, open project with uh, Project X, one of the Google X, and also I also a former Lockheed Martin engineer. Um, what Lockheed Martin does is one of the best defense companies in the world, um, and we have a lot of contracts with DARPA, which is that's the originally of a self-driving car and also robotics applications and company like Boston Dynamics. So Lockheed does F-35 and also um, have a deals with caterpillars on the right side. So those are um, my first background after uh, several years work in DOD experience. DOD stands for uh, Department of Defense. And the second before I start my company, I work with Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman is the second best defense company in the world that actually doing a lot of autonomous vehicles. For example, the Global Hawk. This is one of the wing in the Global Hawk. That actually, what Global Hawk does is surveillance uh, airplane that running autonomously 24/7 in the sky. And as well, I've done also several projects with MIT. For example, with the um, their Tartar Challenge and also their self-driving car. So that that's a bit of a background of mine. So before Waymo starts um, quit out from the Google. And also, uh, Odo get bought up by Uber, doing the self-driving truck. So the original terms of self-driving things, technologies in the old robotics platform, is actually came from CMU and also DARPA and also defense companies. Um, so I start from zero. I start from production car. I start to talk of um, the Honda and also Acros because we more focus in the Asian market cars and. We do a lot of things in in our garage, especially myself. And as you can see here, um, there's a GPS box here, and then there is a GPU that we install. Very, very. Um, it's basically that's the, the server to running our our neural networks applications and all the infrastructures. And I'm doing a lot of stuff also in the control systems, control strategy in the cars. Installing the sensors, and on the top of it, you can see there's a VLP16, which is 16 channels uh, Velodyne lidar on the top. So we were using that in the first terms of doing a localization, a planning, and a control of the car. Okay, so we get the control quickly. So we started in September 16th. We just one person mine, 
And then what we do in the controllers is we can do, can, can we dim the lights a bit? Oops. Uh -oh. Can I go back? I need to play this one. No, you can play it. Uh oh. You should be able to play it. Yeah, it's a video. It's video basically how how we get the steering angle, steering controls of the car for uh, by wire cars completely get controlled. So we take over the electronic power steering, electronic throttle, and electronic brakes. Most of the car today, if 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 we know that, um, okay, talk about cars. I hope this is not going to hurt your brain. So cars, we talk about cars, okay? Cars is like a computer today, okay? Think about, you know, you have, you want to have, a, a com build your own computers. You can customize your car, uh, RAM, you can customize your hard drive, you can customize your type of CPUs, same like in the cars. So cars has, has called things called ECU, right? which is electronic control units or engine control units, right? So in the ECU, the question is, is just only controlled by one ECU or two or three, four ECU? It's actually not. It's actually you have many ECUs, right? For example, you talk with the VSA, right? Vehicle safety. This is controls your brake, your acceleration, ACC, which stands for adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, so this is, this is actually what it meant to be the car as a computer, right? And then also, absolutely, um, if we know, I mean, like Benz, BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, so th those equipped with the sensors, right? There's a millimeter wave sensors, there's also ultrasonic wave sensors with the different types of tier ones, and, you know, mobile eye, perhaps, yeah, from cameras, you know, to, to do a um, simple ADAS. So ADAS stands for Advanced Driving Assistant System. Sorry about my, my writing, <laughs> pardon me. But um, this is actually what makes to the car nowadays today. So many people that come to me like, how do you do it? How, how do you exactly convert the car controls by the joysticks, for example, or you can have a little control of this car. We, we can talk about this after offline if you want to see the video of this. So, so that, that's more into the very first step to gain the controls of the cars. So, and then the car itself, right? You have also another thing called drivetrain. You have a PCM, right? These still consider talk each other with the ECU. And then how this car each other talks is actually with one network that exists back in 80s and then that still happens today with the different many types of ISOs, which is called a CAN bus, right? Perhaps most of um, people that are familiar with tuning the cars and then doing um, a lot of car hackings, they, they know how to play around with the CAN, which is control area network in the car. You have, for example, you have 11 bytes of data that actually assign specific ID, which is comes first, to talk with the ECU, right? So you can control your AC, you can control your um, door, you can control your shift. Is that park, D, drive, neutral, neutral, or reverse? It's all talked through this CAM messaging, either high speed or low speed. And also another thing, you know, absolutely you might ask, is that only CAM, Andrew? No, it's not only CAM, but there is also LIN, flex ray, right? So these, these are what the typical communications that talks to the ECU and in sort of protocol in computers, right? You have like um, Ethernet, right? You have uh, um, wireless, right? So th those are the standards in the car. So we, we easily basically try to reconstruct our own control strategy for developing autonomous vehicle. Now, next. What's next after that? Okay. Um, we know that ADAS, um, they work well. They work really good. They work in heavy rain, they work in 
um, heavy road. If you have your own in this in this situation is like um, you have pedestrians, you have traffic, you have um, a lot of uh, people walking around, you have bicycles, right? So th those are what happens with ADAS. But ADAS problem today is actually you just only can have that for a certain period of time, probably th three minutes, probably two minutes, or even ten seconds, right? So or you know, for example, in ADAS, right? Imagine this is road, in the road, right? You have a top view of the road. And then there you want to, this is your vehicle here. And then you straightly try to change the lanes here, right? This is not autonomous though. This is you steer and then suddenly you try to break your lock to the right, drifting to the right. And then the ADES warns you. That's, that's ADES, right? That's departure warning, lane, uh, adaptive cruise control, right? Now, we know that the way we improve it, just only not taking ADAS completely, but we take off the ADAS completely. That's the beauty of it. So, what we do, what we do is we take approach of end-to-end -end of our self-driving cars, but we fail on that. The reason we fail is, it, it, things is like a black box. Deep learning is like a black box, right? Um, you, you have a much training data, and then you have a supervised learning, and then suddenly you have a model and weights, and then boom, it works. Apparently it's not like that way. Apparently it's more into you have a preprocessing, you have augmentations, you have a data strategy, you have, you have a lot of things that you need to do before you go into the convolutional layers here, right? Before you splice your data. And for that reason is, we, we take the approach of doing end-to-end -end learning in different ways, which is, the first one is the encoder. The encoder takes the convolutional neural network in one vanilla network. And then after that, we, we also can train in auto-encoder, which is, we flip it back and decompose what we already learned into something meaningful using long term memory, right? In case of long short term memory, the, the, the things that are more interesting is because you have the pooling. This is interesting here. If you, in, if you know the meaning of the pooling here, and the beauty of long short term learning here is actually whatever you already done for your course definitions in the beginning from your convolutional network here. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want, I don't want to make dirty. So, oops, what's going on? Get it back, get it back. All right, thank you. So, you see? So, where am I? Oh, yes, chorus. So we have chorus here, right? So one line of the chorus, you, you take that first. So you see that the, we can, what, what it does, it means here is actually, we have input image from here, coming here. We pre-process that, we scale it down, and then we feed it into our convolutional neural network. One, one line, one straight line, right? One, one approach to do that. And after that, we, we have at least um, a predicted controls, three controls, right? Um, back on this, right? Sending controls to the ECU, which is that steering angle, um, brakes, and accelerations. So, Outputting from here, you, we actually already get one rough idea to how to control the cars. But again, when we turn into the driving area, is actually the car did not turn well because the, not about the image, not about the data, not about the, um, not about the, uh, the roads or the controls, the car's not doing good, the car's has issue, none of them, those are correct. But the correct thing is that we think that there is problem with the decoder. The problem with the decoder is we're not having, we weren't, we weren't got the heavy strategy to have a, a different tune to do the heat map. So in chorus brain decoder, what we do is we train what we call as a visual attention. So for example, this is, easier way to understand this, those two pieces. So, 
we go back on the road again. Oops. We go back on the road again. But this time, imagine that you have a front-facing camera attached to your road. Okay. So you, you, you're driving here, and there is a car here, and then there is a car here. So with the, in, in the very first step, what we've done is we have a predicted steering angler, a smooth steering angle, and the actual steering angle. So the, these are the controls um, visualizations in this our self driving car. Similar approach to what um, uh, Stanford has and also NVIDIA has and, and their BB-8. Stanford and the Stanley and Junior basically. So what happens is when when it predicts the behavior of the next car is actually we do the heat map. So we color this. The idea taken from the SegNet, which is segmentation network, but it's more robust because you have ability to do the heat map before you add it in to your LSTM. Those are way more powerful than you just have one vanilla network in end-to-end -end learning approach. Okay, it works. It works well. Our sigmoid turns well, and then our uh, gradient descent becomes way, way much better. We got really, um, when we train that, we got really small RMSE, uh, which is root mean square error. And then um, it, it's, it's, it's way, way much more happier in the, 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 the agent, our car, is way much more happier in the um, uh, less hectic urban environment. So l let's say that in rural area, in, in housing area space, the car can drive autonomous drivingly. Consider that as a level three autonomous driving, which is we will talk that about in a second about definition of the levels of autonomy. Now, um, this is the result that we got after we do all the um, implementations. Again, this is a video. And as you can see here, oh, it works. Really nice. How come this is a brief response didn't work? Interesting. So we have a previous data. So this is data got from the waypoints, from the GPS. And again, we're really happy that in April uh, this year, we finished autonomous lab completely without um, no hands on the steer, no brakes on the, um, no, no feet on the brakes. Completely autonomous control using the AI, using deep learning, using our convolutional learning network. So what happens here, what you can see is, the, the true steering is actually the predicted data sets that we already have. And the raw is actually the, the, the models and weights that we train in within eight hours, we got the output in radians, the, the raw steering angle. But this is, this is really high standard deviation here. And what's going on? Okay, we'll do the smooth strategy. Again, back into our the previous method to do the, um, the strategy to uh, smooth the steering angle is actually, it's very close. Look, there's only one differences here. This is the result that we're using. We implement a vectorizations and normalization. Well, in the last past two years, we know in terms of deep learning and AI that um, many uh, research scientists, they invented the cause that in pre-processing called a mini patch normalization. So you, um, you take whatever the normalization technique in the very beginning of pre-processing before you start to in, uh, implement that in your uh, neural networks. Anything, you can be a recurrent, you have convolutional, anything. So next slide will be, oops. So again, this is the pictures that we took um, the first time we did, went to the Tiger office actually in Santa Clara. And this is our first test on the road, in the highway road from San Diego to Santa Clara, to their office. It's about eight hours drives. And it's interesting, um, the, the, car, the car ran well. The car can, can do complete autonomous driving on the, on the highway really well, just we, without using the mobile eye. And we solved the issue of the, 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 the beginning that I mentioned that only 10, 10 seconds driving, only 12, 10 minutes driving. And then we extend that period today. Actually, we, we came back with another approach with ADAS that giving the deep learning a more uh, robust backup systems if the camera fails 
and we still can self-drive with only using radar. And waypoints from the GPS, RTK, real-time kinematic, and IMU's information. IMU is inertial measurement unit, so if you know about the iPhone stuff, the iPhone has a gyroscope and accelerometer to, to know the positions itself. So we have that in the car, really tiny IMU's, and then we use that information to keep autonomous driving without the camera. So, okay, back to self-driving again. My experience in self-driving cars with DARPA, uh, robotics, you have a really old techniques doing slam, tradi traditional slams, you have uh, many types of slams, right? Slam stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. This is the coolest thing. In fact, Sebastian Trun, the founder of Udacity and Google X, I'm very lucky to get advice by him and mentored by him that actually he, he's a slam guy and he mentioned that the core technologies of autonomous driving it's also in parts of mapping. When I came to Beijing in, in four days, I realized that, wow, Beijing traffic is, is very, very crazy. It's, it's, it's literally like hard to solve. But actually, I'm, I'm, I'm being optimist on this. I'm being really optimist. Because why? The research technology in self-driving car, the key is not generative adversarial network. You ready, guys? It's about the reinforcement learning. That's the truth. You know about your Q factor in your Q network. And you have the, the visions of having the slam com combinations with robotics and self-driving car with deep learning. What we have today, Beijing traffic is going to be very easy. It's, not, it's, it's going to be something that remarkably beautiful to have this technology on the road in China. And I think we can have that. It's not cool. With a push-up button, you can go anywhere you want in Beijing. So, again, I mentioned again about the challenge in robotics and uh, AI platform itself, okay? So, we have two things here in, in self-driving car matrix. You can build a self-driving car just only by, without using deep learning. Take apart the deep learning um, approach. Just do robotics, just do robotics perception. Path planning, localization, um, the car ain't able to localize where it, is, where it is, and simultaneously got the Velodyne, uh, which is the LiDAR company, are really good. You got um, uh, solid state sensors for scanning radar from Dell Pi, or you got uh, another uh, laser scanner from IPO or from Regal. You can have it, but the problem is it's still in development, and how fast it could be. When I say how fast it could be, how fast in cycling through the cycles of you capturing the data and you process the data. So again, there is a race in computational process. Like what Steve mentioned earlier, there is a NVIDIA segmented market using more into um, custom chips that they built for self-driving car, Drive BX, Drive CX, Jetsons. Those are NVIDIA products. But what we need today, what we understand is how we can develop a better backup system and robust, fast, and fast, faster, with a lower cost of technology. So that's the reason there is combination in matrix that you need to have a real-time system embed into the car. Back again to this, ECU. And that's what we're good at. Computer visions, OpenCVs, QT, OpenCL, right? We know all this stuff. As a software engineer, we, we know that um, there is a lot of uh, challenges, for example, like doing uh, future extractions, doing the, um, for example, we have a very, very good example is object detection, right? You want to look at the lightnings and then uh, the lights, and then also the calibration itself of the cameras, and then also the um, course detections on the objects. So those are the challenges in computer visions. Where is it lays out in the deep learning part? It's in the pre-processing. Pre-processing within computer visions is actually the biggest challenge today that what happens developing in autonomous driving. And the third is infrastructure. Um, when you get into the car, have a nice car, right? Or even Tesla. What's Tesla using is what it's mean as Android Auto. Android Auto, it can fall into this category as infrastructure. Robot operating systems in the development. 
that's infrastructures. Okay? QNX from BlackBerry, that's infrastructures. So th those are the software part of it. How about the hardware part? How about the sensor fusions? Are the sensors there? Is it noisy? Is it fully calibrated? Is it easy to use? Can you implement the semi-unsupervised, unsupervised, or even supervised learning on that? Probably. There's still a race here. And that's the reason it's an interesting market today, because um, we, we focus on the AI portion, instead focus on delivering physics and dynamics for the sensors itself, for the hardware. Control strategy, we can deliver. Um, also, I mentioned in the earlier that vehicle networks, you have ECU, you have, um, uh, you have PCM, uh, cluster modules, and all the stuff. Those are part of the vehicle network. One of the vehicle networks. So one of the things that is interesting in the vehicle networks that's going to happen in the next four or five years is actually vehicle security. V2V, V2X, V2I. Those are what happens in the hardware. And then um, for the controls perspective, it's more into making the car become way, way much um, aerodynamics, or what we call as a vehicle dynamics today. This is also combinations between the controls, PIDs, proportional, integrative, and derivations, and also you have hardware in loop. Those are the stuff that what happens in, in the core technologies of self-driving car. Now, it's easy. No, it's not. It's really hard. This is extremely hard. And that's the reason um, us in the startup, we, we focus in delivering this cover portion today with combinations of delivering the hardware. Now, what kind of work I do? How, how, how it works? I mean, how can I, we deliver this fast, right? What OEM things I do, I make a new cars. When we talk to Chang'an, for example, or talk with the uh, uh, motors companies in China, they think that, oh, you want to build a new car. You want to build the future transportation, right? You want to build a, a fancier car that can transform into something. Or you go like transformers, for example, like robotics, right? No, it's not. It's just, it's, that's not our main business model. That's not what we want to deliver. And I talk to my mom, and then my mom says, yeah, you want to make a hybrid electric car. No, it's not. And my friends think my car is like, Alien, especially like Steve mentioned that my car is like from another space. And um, the government thinks I'm, I'm building uh, killing machines, thinking about that. How about if, if, if it drives crazy and then how about your insurance and all the stuff? Well, we sort of kind of like roll it out because we have a license to, to do that, to test on the road. And what, it, what I think I do, I build self-driving cars. But actually what I do is we using GTA 5 to run our segments in 30 frames per second. That's what makes it interesting. <laughs> now, um, what it needs in terms of autonomous driving. So we, we talk a lot in, in the beginning about how the process of um, how autonomous driving works, right? We have, we have ECUs, we have hardware layer, lower layer than the car itself, what's the real-time operating system in the car, and then, again, the big three layers here is the sensing and the processing and also the controls of the cars. These are the core problem today that OEMs trying to get into the consumer market using AI or deep learning in today's market. Now, here's what our achievement since I came back in China. So we took some couple pictures from China roads and test our um, applications in the road. And luckily, we almost get correct here. We got the, uh, the, the, our application for object detection actually works really well. One, it means that it's 100% recognizing this is a car here. And then here too, you see a bunch of cars here. So it recognizes that. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. I'm pretty satisfied and I'm pretty optimistic. Of, of course, I mean, you will ask, how did you do it? How about with my area? How about in nearby my house? Right? So, well, I tell you what. The overall result of the MAP for this is actually 98.1%. There's a chance that it still fails in the smog and heavy terrain, like in the sandstorm. We didn't test this in the sandstorm. So we move to the next. How we solve this, one of the way is we using learning driving behavior, how Chinese people drive, and sort of using simulator, either using um, gazebo, or we have our own closed loop simulator. Now, how about parallel slam, right? What's the typical techniques of 
doing SLAM that combine with the deep learning. This is an interesting area. And then we're figuring this out pretty quickly because we see that within the things in point clouds and generating the data using the SLAM techniques is going to be useful for the map. So we have a platform in our infrastructures that actually keep generating the new data based on the point clouds that we have. Now, we test on simulator. We have our own um, framework that leveraging from the real time, not only just only development like in TensorFlow, MXNet, uh, Pedal Battle, or uh, Cafe, not only that, but we also test in the RC car first. And that's the reason that RC car is really useful in terms of developing autonomous applications before we go out on the road. Who is doing this instead of us? Audi is doing this. And we're proud that we take the same approach like what Audi does to make it ready, better productions in the real car. Now, after that, all those things again, we go back and then we see that how we test on the road, how we map exactly what, how, how Waymo did it, how Waymo did it using the Velodyne. So they take the way of what they call as reflective path. So reflective path means that you can do semi-unsupervised learning to lay it out based on the point clouds. So on the left side is how it looks like in the sunny day, the results. And the right side is heavy rain night. So we correct the path called ghosting. Ghosting is when, when the LIDARs um, uh, have a huge mean standard deviation and standard deviations on the path of doing the uh, object tracking. And using the SLAM optimizations that we have, we correct that. Now, this is actually how it, it performs in the highway driving. So, oops. Hopefully it runs. Does it run? And this is, oh, uh oh. Ah, I'll see you on the video later. And this is how we, we did the autonomous lab. Oh, it works, yay, hooray, it works. Um, we, we tapped these cars to run um, more than th um, 80 miles per hour. Fluctuates using ACC, Adaptive Crit Control. So it runs autonomously, running the Thunder Hill racetrack. Similar to what happens in the um, visual intelligence in using a cloning, the, how, the BA, uh, how our drivers react. So I think that's it. Thank you so much, Beijing. Oh, one more thing. I, I forgot to say that there's more interesting thing actually in, in doing um, deep learning. This is just only one thing, okay? This is just only one thing. Before I, I, I close, um, I really want to, to say this. Uh, one of my friends that works in OpenAI, his name is Dr. Ian Goodfellow, which is he's really cool professor, and I really like him because really smart guy. I, I always want to hang out with him in Stanford. But um, the way he tell me that, AI is a big picture, right? It's a huge picture, whole, whole circles of AI. Now, inside of AI, the way you learn this is you know more about machine learning, right? I talk a lot about unsupervised learning, semi, um, I'm sorry, supervised learning, how you get the feedback from labeled data, and also you take the regression, you take the statistic approach. Those are what machine learning is. So what machine learning is, is actually combinations of this applied statistic, statistic approach and make it output into something meaningful. For example, you think about this way. Have you ever, have you ever um, thought about how, how you can tell to have um, more productive A-B testing for the um, grocery market store? When you go to grocery market and you see that why the aisle is so good? How come they know that uh, I need um, sugar, I need a tea, I need a coffee this week? How come they know that? One of the things that you can think about that is actually soft using machine learning. Don't ever think about deep learning on this. Because deep learning is just gonna, um, makes you a little bit vague about this, really, really vague. So machine learning can solve this by using unsupervised learning before you do A-B testing. This is a really great example for production, operation management, that actually they can put the aisles correctly based on the customer behavior. 
One of the way to solve this is using the k-means and clustering. That's a very popular technique. And that's still in terms of applied statistics. Now, you, you get that knowledge, right? You already understand that good enough. At least you can, you can um, code it in um, Jupyter Notebook or using Scikit, Pandas, all of the stuff. Now, you learn about what it's called representation learning. This is interesting because I, earlier I mentioned about reinforcement learning. You have, um, for example, in self-driving car area, this one of application is when you are in the intersection. You are in the intersection and you are here and you have a traffic light. In the United States, if you're here in the traffic light, you need to turn right. If you're here in the traffic light and suddenly green, you need to move forward and then turn left, for example, even though the, the traffic light is red. So these type of the things that call a representation learning. And then this is really good because it's com combining with the um, theory of, um, what is that? Shoot, I'm suddenly lost my talk. Oh, yes, the game theory, right? You have a discount factor, you have a Q factor, Q learning. These are what happens in re re uh, representation learning, or which, what nowadays we call as um, reinforcement learning. Now, after you get this ascent, then you move to deep learning. Those are the things that we learned today. We have labeled training data, we want to output model, we want to output weights. Those are the key how the AI assembles together. I hopefully this makes everybody clear. And I take this from Professor Ian Goodfellow. Thank you so much. <laughs>